1996. In Sydney, Australia, police mark off an isolated field in one of the city's suburbs. Behind the tape line, the victim of a vicious rape and murder. It stands out as the most horrendous, single, barbaric murder that I'd ever investigated. The crime shocks the country, sparking a massive investigation and manhunt. I've never seen anything that affected the community more. There was community outrage on the largest scale that I've ever seen. It was like a beacon of evil that transfixed the city for months. Along with police, there are those who chronicle the investigation up close, on film, on paper, and on tape. They are the public's first witness. Through their eyes, they capture our darkest chapters of crime. was gripped by one of the biggest police investigations in Sydney's history. February 1986, summer in Australia. Like many in the greater Sydney area, thousands of residents of the suburb of Blacktown commute for work into the heart of the city. Well, Blacktown is about 35 kilometres uh, west of Sydney. Sydney was expanding fairly quickly in the, uh, in the mid to late 80s. And it was traditionally a working class suburb, so mainly workers would come into Sydney, they'd get on the train, do a day's work, get on the train and come home again. At the time, a young local woman named Anita Kabi is part of the crowd making the daily trip. She was um, a 26-year-old, had a group of close friends, close to her family, just an average girl living in the western suburbs of Sydney. A few years earlier, Anita became well-known in the area after winning a local beauty contest. She had very striking looks and she had great poise. And in fact, uh, she'd been crowned uh, the Miss Western Suburbs Charity Queen. And while she didn't like the idea of modelling, she felt quite shy. I think that she thought she could do some good by raising money for charity, um, and which she did. She raised quite a lot of money. Now finished modelling, Anita continues to help others by working as a nurse in a downtown Sydney hospital. Anita was like a, a, a ray of sunshine in the ward where she worked at Sydney Hospital, and they loved her. Although Anita was briefly married to another nurse named John Cobby, the two have separated by February of 1986. Anita has moved back into her family home in Blacktown with her parents, Gary and Grace, the home she commutes back to after working in the city. Her parents loved having a home. In fact, they had her bedroom um, all there ready for her. Nothing much had changed since she'd moved out and got married to John and it was just like she was a teenager again. She had um, a lot of friends. She was vivacious, very um, quiet natured, but um, had a good heart, was very good to her family, and I couldn't find anyone that said a bad word about Anita Cobby. Sunday, February 2nd, 1986. After a routine shift at the hospital, Anita postpones her daily commute home so she can join two friends for dinner at a downtown restaurant. The group shares a few bottles of wine and plans an upcoming holiday. As darkness falls, Anita's friends offer her a place to stay in the city, but she decides to return home 
to Blacktown. They dropped her off at the main railway station in Sydney, and the last they saw of her was her walking into the station to catch the train. 10 p.m. Back in Blacktown, Anita's father waits to hear from his daughter. He normally picks her up at the local train station, a long walk from their home. He waits up until midnight, but the call doesn't come. They felt she'd probably stayed over um, at a friend's place for the night, but they were a little bit concerned because she hadn't rung. I remember Gary saying that he looked out of the window and saw a d big dark cloud and the clouds were coming over the sky and he, he said he had a feeling that something was incredibly wrong and he just couldn't put his finger on it. The very next day, Anita, who was always super punctual, didn't come to work. After half an hour of Anita not showing up for her shift, the hospital rang her father, who said she may have stayed with friends, as she often did. So they rang the two friends that they thought she may have stayed with, and when Anita wasn't at that, those girls' places, then they realised something was wrong. Anita's parents contact Anita's younger sister, Catherine, and her ex-husband, John Covey. Nobody has seen their daughter. Increasingly worried, Anita's father, Gary, heads to the police station to report his daughter missing. Gary Lynch was very hopeful that Anita would be found. So I think the worst time for them was waiting because they, they couldn't do anything. They just had to sit and wait. February 4th, 1986. Almost two days have passed since Anita was last seen when something strange is spotted in a field known as Boiler's Paddock. The field sits along an isolated road often used by teenagers as a lover's lane. There was a, a local farmer who had a property at Blacktown and uh, one morning he noticed some cows gathered in the paddock and he'd seen them in, in the same location the day before. And he thought it was just a bit unusual. Cows normally graze and move on around the, the, uh, the field. Riding out towards the cows to investigate, the farmer comes across the body of a young woman, the victim of a brutal, deadly attack. Shaken by the discovery, the farmer hurries home and calls police. Local Blacktown officers, followed by homicide detectives from Sydney, rush to the remote location. When I first arrived at the crime scene, I just took in what I could see without disturbing uh, the, the area around the, the body. It was a shocking scene. I think the thing that probably hit me most was, was the look in the eyes of the deceased. You, know, you could see the terror that she must have gone through and the desolation, just the fact that she was in this field by herself and something that I'll probably never forget. Beyond a wedding ring, there is no identification on the body and the victim's face has been badly beaten. A photo brought to the scene, however, convinces police they have just found Anita Kabi. Forensic expert Paul Hamilton arrives to search for clues. I approached the deceased and I commenced to take quite a number of photographs, both in colour and in black and white. Some injuries to her body were absolutely horrendous. She had defence wounds on her, on her fingers. She had major lacerations to her throat. Horrendous injuries. She had had a terrible, terrible time fighting for a life. At the time, DNA technology is not yet available, but basic blood typing can help link a suspect to a crime. Hamilton gathers samples from around the body, but given that two days of intense heat have passed since the time of death, the samples are of little use. While police fan out across the field looking for further clues, Detective Ian Kennedy prepares to break the news to Anita's family. I removed the wedding ring from the body, placed it in a plastic bag, and uh, took it to the father of the missing girl. Obviously, when uh, a policeman knocks on the door, 
and uh, talks to them about what they think is just some further news about their missing daughter, that maybe she's been found or something. And then I've had to tell them the, the horrible news that uh, we'd found a body in the field. Anita's younger sister, Catherine, recognizes the wedding ring. It is the one John Cobby gave to Anita. The shock uh, is extreme, as one could imagine. We then took the father to the morgue and he made the formal identification of the body. It stood out in my mind because when he looked at the body and recognised his daughter, he started to sag at the knees. And uh, I said, is that the body of your daughter, Anita? And he said, I wish I could say that it was someone else's daughter, but I can't because it is my daughter. The full brutality of the attack on Anita becomes clearer in the autopsy. Along with being raped, perhaps by more than one person, Anita's throat bears one of the worst wounds ever seen by local police. The cause of death was by way of loss of blood and horrendous injuries caused by a very sharp object, such as a knife. The offender had actually cut into the deceased's neck and I'm fairly sure that uh, on reflection that he'd actually tried to decapitate her. By evening, a joint task force is established between local Blacktown police and homicide detectives from Sydney. At the same time, news of the murder spreads, leading to intense media coverage and public outrage. Anita Cobby's murder was shocking. It transfixed the nation. What was different, I think, about this crime was that people related to it. She was a local girl, she'd won the beauty contest, she was a nurse, she was everything good. And then something so tragic happened to her. It was clear that there was some madman or maniac on the loose. February 4th, 1986. In Sydney, Australia, police are investigating the brutal rape and murder of a 26-year-old nurse and former beauty queen named Anita Cobby. She was last seen alive heading home to the suburb of Blacktown. Not far away, her body was found in an isolated field. When a murder takes place, the police talk to the family and try and find out who might have a motive uh, for killing a particular victim. Quite often, the murder is committed by an immediate family member or close friend of the victim. After quickly ruling out Anita's parents and sister, detectives question the victim's estranged husband, John Cobby. When he realised he was a suspect, particularly when I asked him the question, did you kill your wife? He broke down and said, no, it wasn't him. We followed up his alibi and eventually eliminated him as the as a suspect. Police soon realize they may be facing a random killing, the hardest kind to solve. The most important and crucial part of any police investigation is the first 72 hours. And in that first 72 hours, the police really had very, very little to go on. They had no motive, no murder weapon. There was absolutely nothing to link anyone or anything to Anita's body. Police begin retracing Anita's last known steps. According to her friends, they said goodbye to Anita just before 9 at Sydney's main railway station, meaning she missed the 8.45 train. The next train to Blacktown left Sydney at 9.12. Police find a train guide who seems to recall Anita being on this second later train. This would mean she arrived in Blacktown around 10. Exiting the suburban station at that time of night, she normally would have called her father for a ride. The investigators initially thought that it would have been unusual for her to walk the distance from the railway station to her parents' home. It was a distance of some two kilometres, if not further. So it was quite a, a walk. One of the theories was that she was trying to call her family from a public telephone, but when the police looked, it appeared that the phones had been damaged and she couldn't use the public phones.
Detectives feel Anita may have hailed one of the many taxis that frequent the station. I was involved in some of the investigation regarding the taxi services. A lot of taxi drivers were interviewed. One of the taxi drivers may have picked her up and taken her to another location. Police also begin <laughs> compiling a list of known criminals and sexual offenders living in the Blacktown area. That area of Blacktown is quite a heavily populated area. It was basically a needle in a haystack type situation. And initially, we were coming up with nothing. February 5th, 1986. 24 hours after the discovery of Anita's body, police find what may be their first big lead. A chilling memo of a phone call to police the night Anita went missing. According to the memo, two local residents reported seeing an abduction only a few blocks from the Blacktown station. Although police had responded to the call at the time and found nothing, detectives now revisit the scene to re-interview the witnesses, a 14-year-old girl and her brother. According to the young siblings, it was around 10 p.m. on Sunday night. They were watching TV in their living room when there was a sudden commotion outside. They had heard a car and they heard screams. They raced outside their home and saw two men dragging a woman into the car. The woman was resisting and screaming and trying to get away. And one man had her by the hair and lifted her up by the arms and the other picked her up by the feet and threw her into the car. Unfortunately, the street lighting wasn't too good. There were two, possibly four men in the car as well, two in the front, two in the back, and the car had driven off. According to the witnesses, their older brother arrived home moments later. Hearing their story, he jumped in his own car with his girlfriend to see if he could find the vehicle they had seen. His first instinct was to drive to the local lover's lane, the road along Boiler's Paddock, the same field Anita's body would be found in two days later. He went along, he found three cars. Uh, two of them were not the type of car that he had been told was involved in the abduction. Uh, one was, but it was a different model to the one he thought he was looking for. And uh, in the headlights, there didn't seem to be anyone in the car. Although police investigated the incident the night it took place, in retrospect, it now seems like a possible sighting of Anita Cobby's abduction. The police enlist the public's help in the search for the suspect car, described as a later model four-door sedan, gray in color, possibly the same gray that is often used as a primer or undercoat. It was obvious that it was a great strain and a very, very difficult time. I got asked to go out to the Lynch family's home and do an interview with them, and it was something that I really didn't want to do. Um, I, I felt I was encroaching on their grief, and I felt it was probably a private time. I knocked on the door, and Gary Lynch opened it up, and he threw his arms around me, and he thanked me for coming. And we talked for a long time, and he was so humble, um, wanting me to write something about his daughter. Very, very difficult. They really just wanted whoever had killed Anita to be brought to justice. A $50,000 reward is soon offered for any information leading to an arrest in the case. It was on the front page of every newspaper. There were people appealing for help to come forward for information. Um, it really was dominating every minute of every day. With media coverage at a saturation point, thousands of tips start flowing into police headquarters. I was on the switchboard and people would ring up things from hearing a scream or, or seeing tail lights or seeing a car. There was a mountain of information and that had to all be sifted through. We got calls from everywhere. I mean, I think there was leads came in from all over Australia that were following this. The pressure was, was on them to find the killers quickly because they were still out there and while they were there, there was potential for another person to be killed. Within days, one public tip will help focus the investigation giving police their first concrete suspects. February 8th, 1986. In Sydney, Australia, 
A growing task force works to solve the rape and murder of 26-year-old Anita Cobb, a local nurse and former beauty queen. The brutal nature of the crime has sparked outrage across the country. For police, the only lead involves an eyewitness account of a gray four-door sedan used in an abduction around the time Anita went missing. It was obvious that we were struggling to come up with any clues, so every morning at 9 o'clock and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I would conduct a short press conference, just give them an update as to where the inquiry was going and continue to ask for public assistance in coming forward with anything that they thought may have been of interest to us. Police search local junkyards, as well as hotel and bar parking lots, hoping to find the gray sedan. Owners of similar vehicles are questioned about their whereabouts the night Anita went missing. At the same time, in an attempt to locate more eyewitnesses to the crime, police decide to carry out a reenactment of Anita's last known movements. Debbie Wallace, uh, a local policewoman, was picked. She was similar height, similar colour, similar shape to Anita. February 9th, Sunday night, 9 p.m. Dressed as Anita, Constable Wallace begins to follow the fateful steps the young nurse took exactly one week earlier. Police follow behind, questioning locals along the way. In Blacktown, Constable Wallace walks into the residential area near the station. It was simply myself and the detectives following some distance behind in a car. I remember thinking, at the time when it was very, very quiet, and very dark, what she felt right at this moment. You know, she was just, at this moment, she was just like me, and yet, very shortly, she, she wasn't going to exist. The reenactment ends at the exact spot eyewitnesses saw a woman pulled into a gray four door sedan. When it comes to fresh leads, police returned to the station that night empty handed. Police had been working for um, six or seven days straight with very, very few leads, and it was it was starting to show. I noticed that the police were getting emotional when they held press conferences, that the strain was showing. And I think that the police felt they owed it to the Lynch family to go back to them with information, but at that point they just didn't have anything to tell them. February 11th, 1986. Nine days have passed since Anita was last seen alive, when police suddenly get a promising call on their tip line. We received a telephone call in relation to a car that had been stolen, it corresponded to the car that had been used in the abduction. A number of people were nominated as having been uh, involved in the theft of that car. According to the caller, those same people were seen driving around Blacktown in the gray sedan the same night, Anita was killed. Three different men are identified. 18-year-old John Travers is the apparent leader of the group. The other two men are his friends, Mick Murdoch and Les Murphy. All three are well known to local police, with various criminal records dating back to their early teens. The criminal activity involving John Travers centred around several of his friends where they would range from petty crimes of um, stealing money and cars and drugs right through to um, serious assaults. John Travers was a man who didn't have a job. A John Travers day would revolve around drinking, smoking marijuana, um, stealing things and then he'd wake up and do the same thing again the next day. Looking closer into their new lead, police learn that John Travers is also a suspect for an alleged sexual assault in Western Australia. He is known to carry a large knife, much like the kind used to kill Anita Kabi, and has a disturbing reputation in Blacktown for sexually assaulting and killing animals. There were several people who had called police and nominated John Travers as perhaps a person who would be capable of committing such a horrendous crime, um, mainly for the brutality side. Once this information came in, obviously it needed our full attention. 
Although no evidence ties the men to Anita's murder, police decide to make a coordinated move and bring them in for questioning. Well, what we hoped was that we would catch people with the car that we're looking for. It was used in the abduction, and then maybe they may have admitted their involvement in the murder inquiry or uh, told us what they knew. February 21st, 6 a.m. Police approach two different residences. At one location, they break down the door and find John Travers and Mick Murdoch sharing a bed. At John Travers' usual residence, they find Les Murphy. Although denying any knowledge of the car's current whereabouts, all three men admit to stealing a four-door sedan a few weeks earlier and respraying it gray. Some parts from the missing car, including stolen wheels and seat covers, are found with Les Murphy. And we took them back to the police station, interviewed them in relation to the theft of the car and the theft of the car seats and the wheels off the car. And in the process of that inquiry, we questioned them about any knowledge they had of the murder. You could see the shock and the surprise in their faces. Each of them denied being involved in the murder, um, knowing who was involved in the murder, but we believe that they were lying. Their body language, the things that they were saying, we believe we were on the right track. Initially, Michael Murdoch and Les Murphy were charged with car theft, and while the police thought that they were involved in the Anita Cobby murder, they had absolutely no evidence um, to keep them at the police station any longer. So they were charged and released, and then they were put under surveillance and watched very, very closely. Since ringleader John Travers is suspected in at least one other sexual assault case, police can keep him in custody for questioning. But despite their hunch, they still need hard proof against all three men if they are going to solve the crime gripping the country. We were, we were then going flat out to try and find that information. Before long, a simple request for cigarettes ends up breaking the case wide open. February 1986. Police in Sydney, Australia, are trying to solve the rape and murder of 26-year-old Anita Cobby. Although nothing connects them directly to the crime, the prime suspects are three local men, John Travers, Mick Murdoch, and Les Murphy. The men have admitted to driving a stolen vehicle similar to the one that abducted a woman the night Anita went missing. Holding John Travers in custody for unrelated sexual assaults, police keep watch on his two close friends while searching for the car in question. Well, at that stage, the car was all we had. So it was pretty important we find the car because the car could then possibly disclose the clothing, her personal effects, fingerprints of any offenders. So it was pretty important. That was the major link between the abduction and the subsequent murder. So we were trying to pull out all stops to find it. On February 22nd, 1986, there is a striking new development in the case. John Travers, while he was in custody, had requested that a family member um, come and bring him cigarettes to the cells. When contacted by police, the family member breaks into tears on the other end of the line. She claims to have valuable information about John Travers. Although she wants to meet with police, she is too afraid to come in. Detective Sergeant Kevin Rowey arranges a clandestine meeting with the woman, known only to the public as Miss X, at a neutral location away from the station. So I made contact with the woman in a darkened car park at the back of a, of a sporting club. Uh, she was very nervous and very concerned about her own welfare and about her identity being revealed to the offenders. At the same time, she was uh, quite convinced that Travers had, in fact, uh, killed Anita. And she had known John Travers for quite a long time, and she, she was quite close to him. In fact, she was John's confidant, and whenever things were wrong, he would talk to her. 
Miss X explains that John Travers once confessed to her that he raped a woman in another city and also told her in graphic detail of a sexual assault on a man, the same crime he is linked to in Western Australia. He had uh, held a knife to the throat of a male person while he was having uh, sexual intercourse with this male person, held his hair and lifted his throat up, held the knife at his throat and threatened to cut his throat. And we believe that's the manner in which Anita Cobby was subsequently killed. So it was of real interest to us at that particular stage. Now, even more certain they have the right man, police hope they can use John Travers' trust of Ms. X to their advantage. They convince her to take him the cigarettes he has asked for and see what else she can find out. Remarkably, not long after Miss X appears, Travers begins confiding in her again, this time about Anita Cobby. She asked him a few details about this case and she was absolutely horrified and shocked when he said yes, that he had committed the crime. John Travers describes how he himself cut Anita's throat. She said that he had a look of delight and joy on his face, which is, to a normal person, incredible. She started to shake and tremble, and Kevin Rowley could see her from down at the end of the cells. Not only does Travers admit his own role in the crime, he implicates Mick Murdoch and Les Murphy, along with two additional men, Les Murphy's brothers, Michael Murphy and Gary Murphy. What had started off as an abduction and gang rape eventually led to murder. He confessed to her about how there were five of them involved and they had to kill her and cut her throat because she knew who they were and things like that. Miss X returns down the corridor to police, visibly shaken. She collapsed uh, when she came back and I had to assist her back upstairs to the operations centre um, where she was very distressed and, and uh, informed us that he had in fact admitted to having killed Anita. Their suspicions confirmed. Police know they still need something more concrete to take before a court of law. At that stage, we had her word against his in a statement. Later that day, police wire Miss X up for a second visit. It was a listening device which was attached to her stomach that was then monitored in the operations room. Miss X shows up again at John Travers' cell door. She wasn't to entice the answers out of him. She was just basically respond to anything that he said. And he went right through the admissions that he'd made earlier to her. And she came back out and it was recorded on tape. After two long weeks on the case, police finally have their hands on valuable concrete evidence. I was a feeling of satisfaction when an investigation turns your way that significantly. But they also realised that there were other people involved in this crime and that Travers hadn't acted alone and it was now up to them to round up the rest of the men. That evening, Mick Murdoch and Les Murphy are arrested a second time and brought into custody. When confronted with the existence of a tape-recorded confession, John Travers admits to cutting Anita's throat. Well, the other two admit to playing a role in the crime. Also implicated once again in confessions are Les Murphy's two brothers, Michael and Gary Murphy, whereabouts unknown. Like their brother in custody, both men are well known to police. They all had criminal backgrounds going back to when they were juveniles, 13, 14 years of age. No matter where they went, they all got into trouble. News of the breakthrough spreads quickly in the media. Excuse the old cliche, but it was a, a media frenzy. It was just hysterical and the public went hysterical as well. Pent-up anger over the crime turns to outrage as the three accused prepare to face formal charges. They were mined up seven or eight deep in the road outside the police station. They were rocking the car and swearing at them. If they could get their hands on them, they'd have ripped them apart. It was something that I'd never experienced here in, in Sydney before. 
for police, however, the investigation is far from over. There was no change in momentum, if you like, which would normally occur after the after significant arrests in a major investigation. Three had been arrested, but two were still at large and were correctly portrayed as two of Australia's most wanted uh, suspects. In the next few days, police will launch one of the largest manhunts in Australian history, hoping once and for all to serve justice in the case of slain Anita Coffey. February 23rd, 1986. In Sydney, Australia, police have three men in custody for the rape and murder of 26-year-old Anita Cobby. Charged are 18-year-old ringleader John Travers, along with Mick Murdoch and Les Murphy. In confessions, they have implicated two others, Les Murphy's brothers, Michael and Gary. The entire country has been put on alert to find these suspects, now considered to be Australia's most wanted persons. I recall returning to the operations centre, the intensity of the, of the investigation was very obvious. Phones were ringing, uh, there was a, a lot of information coming through uh, on alleged sightings of the two Murphy brothers. After numerous false leads, one tip is promising. A resident of a suburb 30 miles from Blacktown is sure the Murphy brothers are hiding in a local apartment. That person believed he had sighted one of the Murphys in the backyard and that there had been a person constantly looking out from behind a curtain, acting suspiciously. Within the hour, officers move into position and storm the apartment. Michael Murphy is discovered in the living room and promptly handcuffed. Uh, Gary Murphy had uh, run from the premises out the rear door and was tackled by uh, members of the tactical response team that were lying in wait. At the station, both men admit to being present the night Anita was killed. <laughs> With all five men now in custody, a sense of relief finally spreads through police ranks. All the negativity was just thrown out the window that we'd done a good job, that we had, in our opinion, a very good case against uh, each of the accused for the murder. The revelation that five men, three of them brothers, are behind the crime fuels a public anger already widespread. In many ways, Anita Coppy was looked upon as an angel. And the community felt that these men didn't deserve to live and that they should pay with their lives for taking someone else's life so violently. In March of 1987, all five men go to trial, charged with the abduction, rape and murder of Anita Coppy. With a recorded confession secured by Miss X against him, in which he actually admits to slitting the victim's throat, John Travers changes his plea from not guilty to guilty. Miss X turned out to be um, a bit of a hero in all of this. But she was placed on witness protection for herself and her family's protection. She was an uh, extremely brave woman to come forward. With the leader of the gang taken from court until sentencing, Mick Murdoch, along with Les, Gary, and Michael Murphy, all plead not guilty and stand trial. There was a huge roll-up of media from all around Australia. Every day, that courtroom, number five at Darlinghurst, was packed. I've never seen that before or since. The press box was absolutely jam-packed every day. Among the crowd are Anita's parents, Grace and Gary. Them sitting there every day must have been the most difficult task. It was to represent their daughter, to be put a put a personality, I guess, put a face to their daughter so she wasn't forgotten in all the evidence. While the accused now try to go back on their original stories, claiming the police forced them to admit to the crime, the combined words of their first confessions paint a chilling picture of the night of the crime. <laughs> It appears that Anita got on the train to go to Blacktown to her parents' home and did get off at the other end at the normal stop. And whatever happened, she decided to walk home, which was probably a 20-minute walk from the train station. 
Only a few blocks into her walk, the suspects notice her from their stolen gray sedan. Stopping beside her, John Travers and Mick Murdoch leap out and drag her inside. An incident seen by the two young witnesses. She was raped by two of the accused in the back of the car almost immediately. The group then drives out to the remote field known as Boiler's Paddock, where they take turns raping her again. Imagine her terror. Ima well, you can't imagine her terror. At one point, the group notices headlights. The passing car is driven by the brother of the two eyewitnesses, along with his girlfriend, out looking for the suspicious car his siblings had seen moments earlier. Although he actually sees the suspect's car, there is confusion about the model. When they, they saw the car, they didn't think it was the same car. The brother of the eyewitnesses turns and leaves, unaware that Anita is only a few hundred feet away. What I found uh, disturbing about that was how close they were to being located, and that's what chills me to this very day. After raping Anita again, the five men prepare to leave. And then they've decided that uh, they'd had enough and that she'd possibly identified some of them by hearing their voices and some of their names, so they decided to kill her, which they did. Although police and the prosecution argued that raping and killing Anita was a group decision, John Travers was the one with a knife and the one who slit Anita's throat. Clearly, one person may have done it. In this case, it was Travers. But the others were all there, and they did nothing to stop him. The Travers that emerged during the trial was a pretty sad and horrifying creature. He seemed to have a a psychopathic streak that enabled him to inflict great cruelty on others. And uh, as you hear from uh, lots of other stories of um, brutal killers, uh, they start with animals, as he did, and they progress onto humans, and the um, ferocity of their attacks escalates. On June 10th, 1987, the jury returns their verdict. After more than 10 hours of deliberation, they find the defendants guilty of all charges. Soon joined by John Travers in the dock, the defendants stand and face the judge to learn their fate. Justice Maxwell went through each charge and he said to the five defendants, I am going to show you as much mercy as you showed Mrs. Cobby. In an unprecedented move, they are sentenced by the judge to life in prison, but with a special recommendation that they never be paroled. He requests that each of their files be stamped never to be released. And at that moment, the entire courtroom erupted into jubilant, clapping, whistling, you could see it actually hit the defendants because they all seemed to slump slightly when they heard it. The sentence helps bring closure to Anita's grief-stricken family, as well as those closely involved with the case. The Lynch family were very relieved at, at the, uh, the court result, but I think they also felt that the never-to-be-release was something um, that was the right thing for Anita that it was um, probably a nice touch in her honour and in her memory because that had never been used in an Australian court before. Related that she got justice. Um, yeah, I had a few tears. But, uh, I think the tears were just overcome with the emotion as well and uh, the fact that relief. Today, John Travers. 
Mick Murdoch, and Les, Gary, and Michael Murphy remain behind bars. John Travers and uh, the rest of his gang um, are in different prisons in New South Wales. They're also in um, confinement, so they don't, they're not in the mainstream with other prisoners, but they're in a restricted area. It's a punishment they will never escape after committing one of the worst crimes in modern Australian history. One that touched the very psyche of the country. This case caused fear to grip the community. This case showed us that monsters lurk everywhere. The end result was very good in that they will never uh, walk the streets again.